الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على سيدنا ونبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا We're going to be looking at some essential principles related to the halal and haram to how we live the law that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made us responsible for and how we live that with excellence, fulfilling the purpose, the highest purpose of life because there's a certain quality that distinguishes true believers from others. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in Surah Al-Baqarah, وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَشَدُّ حُبًّا لِلَّهِ And those who believe are more intense in their love of Allah. We're going to look at how we can live the law in a meaningful manner by looking at 10 keys that are gathered from the, work, from the words of you know, our noble scholars. The first of these is to understand the wisdom of limits. Right? That these limits that we have with respect to our conduct, our dress, what we can eat and what we can't eat, how we earn a living, how we spend, how we invest, the limits related to our social relationships, the re limits related to our speech, the limit related also to the states of our heart. What is the wisdom behind there being these limits? Why can't we just do whatever we want? And they mention a number of wisdoms. Ultimately, these limits are a means of entering into a state of submission and drawing closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through that submission to become conscious of Allah in our daily life. Because it is easy to forget God. Right? That you, you go to the mosque or you perform your prayer and you strive for consciousness of God. But then you walk into your daily life and you forget. So these limits, both the limits of obligation and the limits of encouragement, the recommended acts, serve this purpose of reminder. So they're means of attaining unto closeness and love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they're also means of acquiring, acquiring restraint in life. Right? Acquiring restraint. So that we don't just do whatever we feel like. Because if we don't acquire restraint, then we can fall into wrongdoing. We can fall into wrongdoing. Right? Because then when we are, these limits sometimes may appear to relate to small little things. That what's the big deal about, about drinking with your right hand rather than your left? Right? Why not just drink with the left hand? It may be more convenient. Like for example, right now the glass is to my left. So why can't I just pick it up and drink with my left hand? Right? It doesn't appear to be a big deal. But these things can condition and restrain our conduct so that we acquire restraint. So then we're, when we're tested with respect to serious matters, such as the rights of others, such as not cheating or deceiving others, such as not usurping others' rights, such as not falling into those acts that are most odious to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that we've acquired this restraint. And this restraint is the key to the highest of human virtues, which is taqwa, which is piety or God-fearingness, being mindful of God, lest one fall into his displeasure and lest one fall out of a state of submission as he has commanded. So this is the wisdom, some of the wisdom behind these limits. Now when we strive to obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in our daily life, right, so we seek what is halal, what is permissible, we avoid what is haram, we strive to do what is obligatory and avoid disliked matters. What is the underlying intention? A lot of us see these limits as a burden. A lot of us see these limits as some kind of heavy burden. That, oh my goodness, I can't do this. You go to the supermarket and you check out these ingredients and you're like, it, it feels like a burden. And in some ways it is a burden. What is the word for moral responsibility in Arabic? Anyone? Taklif. What does taklif mean? And actually, this is where Urdu helps out, right? And actually, this is all with light letters in Arabic, though it's, a, it's something heavy. Um, because normally, if you want to understand an Arabic concept, and you know some Urdu, 
All you have to do is to pronounce it more softly and add a ta at the end. So for example, in Arabic say nasiha, right? But that's heavy. So you say nasihat, right? And then the word will be familiar to you. But taklif in Arabic means ilzam ma fihi kulfa, make, making one responsible for something in which there's difficulty. The Urdu term is somewhat more direct because Urdu terms that are the same as Arabic terms don't always have the same meanings. Sometimes they may come from the same general direction, but the meaning may be different. What does taklif mean in Urdu? Pain, Pain right? Respons being responsible is painful. You guys have Fajr at a really scary hour, right? And that's not easy, right? That's not easy. It's painful. There's a degree of difficulty in it. Although Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that Allah has not placed any undue difficulty in your religion. That everything that we've been made responsible for in, in the general case is within reasonable human ability. And when things become unduly difficult, when there's haraj, then there are dispensations in our religion. There's ease that comes. And there's an important legal principle related to that. That that when matters become constrained, then rulings become more expansive. But in this submission, in staying within the limits of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the believer has a clear intention, which is to seek the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One does not approach this as some kind of burden, but rather one sees it as an opportunity. Because each of these limits is a means of expressing that one cares, expressing that one is committed to submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It, it's an expression of longing for the divine. So this intention has to be clear. Why are you doing that? Lillahi Rabbil Alameen. For the sake of Allah, the Lord of the worlds. And that should be clear. And then one should strive to gain further knowledge in order that one have clarity about how one can seek the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in any specific action in which one is submitting to him. Because the submission of one who while committed to submit also knows and understands and has clarity of why they're submitting would be greater. Right? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, هَلْ يَسْتَوِي الَّذِينَ يَعْلَمُونَ وَالَّذِينَ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ Are those who know like those who know not? Right? Two people, people may submit, but the one of knowledge and understanding, if they have the, the same degree of sincerity as a person who doesn't know, will be far better off. So one should be clear about that. The intention and submission is to seek the pleasure of Allah, is to follow the, the prophetic example in order that one, uh, that one attain unto the pleasure of Allah and to be beloved to Allah and His Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And there's numerous other intentions, as, as we'll see. The third important key that we wanted to make clear is what does it mean to submit? Right? What does it mean? To submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Some people, they have what you can call gas. You know what gas is? Sheikh Idris, do you know what gas is? Gas is a general attitude of submission. Right? So you're told you have to pray. They say, okay, I saw Brother Omar pray. So you just go through the same general motions. So you have a general submission, right? You say, okay, I need to, you know, there, there's certain limits I have to uphold regarding work. So you say, well, I'll just avoid the really bad things and inshallah, everything should be okay. So it's gas, right? It's a general attitude of submission. But this is not what submission is. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes it clear that we have to submit to Him in what He has called us to submit completely, right? And what is submission? Submission is very simple. Submission is to obey the command of Allah as he has commanded for his sake alone. It requires knowledge. Right? That's the fourth important key. You need knowledge in order to submit because you need to know what the, what the divine command is. Right? And you, you, you follow that and you do it for his sake alone. Right? And this has a lot of implications because many people hear a general command and they try to implement it but when you don't have knowledge, you'll fall into one of two extremes. Right? Into one of two ex excesses. One is to go beyond limits, and that's excess. 
You know, that's, that's extremism, right? That is going to extremes in what one does. And the other limit is to do less than what you've been called upon to do, and that is laxity. And the middle way, the straight path, is the path between all two extremes, right? Between the extreme of excess and remissness, excessiveness and laxity, and, and every other extreme, whether outward, inward, or intellectual. So this is, this is critical, that you, you need, to, in order to be in a state of submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you have to fulfill the divine command, which requires that you learn what that divine command is, and you learn it in a sound manner. Right? You learn it in a sound manner. And this relates both to one's conduct and also one's understanding. Right? Also one's understanding, particularly in our times, because very often the understandings that are conveyed are rather confused, are rather confused. Yesterday, I had a talk in Preston and some young, angry young men tried to challenge about this hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that, umirtu an uqatil an nas hatta yashhadu an la ilaha illallah. The hadith, and it's the 40 Nawi. Their translation was, I was commanded to kill people until they enter Islam. I was like, hmm. Where do you get that translation from? Okay. And it comes from ignorance. And ignorance is very dangerous. Because the hadith, the, the, there's a difference between qatl and, you know, and an aqtul an nas and an uqatil an nas. Aqtul an nas means I've been commanded to kill people. Whereas uqatil means I've been commanded to fight right, or to struggle against people. And it says an nas, the people. Right? And the definite particle in the Arabic language either refers to the entire category, which is absurd. Right? Because you look at the life of the Prophet, who did he go around trying to kill? Right? You have to be crazy to just kill the people. Right? Or it refers to a specific group. Right? To a specific group. And what is it referring to? There's a context to the hadith. By consensus, as Imam Qurtubi and no Imam Nawawi and the other great hadith commentators make clear that the people here being referred to are Quraysh after they broke the peace treaty that they had at Hudaybiyah. Right? So this little ignorance, so it was specific to that condition. They had a truce and it was broken and they, were en they entered into a state of war. So the implication of the hadith, we'd continue in that state of war unless they desist, or un unless they su surrender or they submit. And war is not about saying, okay, why don't we go out for lunch together, right? It's serious business. But it has, it's not of general import, but people out of their ignorance take that. So this is why knowledge is critical for submission, not only in your outward conduct, but also in your attitude and understanding. So this is the fourth key, that you cannot properly submit to Allah without knowledge. But the fifth question to ask ourselves is what knowledge are we called upon to have? The knowledge that you're called upon to have is the knowledge that relates to the circumstance you're in. That what do you need to know in order to submit to Allah as He has commanded in the way most pleasing to Him, in your circumstance. Right? So for you to learn details upon details about how to purify a well if a rat falls into it, right? if you're a student of knowledge, maybe there might, might be some implication because some, some farmers somewhere out there in Yorkshire may have this problem that they have a few open wells that you may have to be answering questions about. But for the average person, that is not important. But for, them to, but for you to learn how you can be a dutiful child, how you can be a good husband, a good wife, how you can fulfill the limits that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how you can uphold the limits that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you with respect to your conduct at work so that you can be a good employee, you can be someone who promotes the good in society. That is the knowledge that you need. That what, do you, what do you need given the circumstances that you're in? If you're a medical doctor, it's more of a priority for you to learn about how you can be a doctor who upholds 
proper, proper ethics and, and who stays within the limits of the Sharia when it comes to your actions. And doctors do all kinds of funny things. Right? If you're an accountant, you know, my, my, my father was an accountant and once he, he was quite, Trump, quite upset because you know, there's some people over and, and they're all from, you know, one person said to the other, you know, said to the other I need to, you to do the books for my business this year. So the accountant says, do you want to show a profit or a loss? Right? There's a common expression in accounting called cooking the books. Right? Because sometimes there's an advantage to showing a loss. Right? Other times there's an advantage to showing profit. Depends on your business strategy. But some of the ways that that, that is done are unethical. So you need to know what are the limits that are unequivocal for you as a believer with respect to proper ethical conduct at work. So it doesn't matter if these particular actions aren't against generally accepted accounting practices or generally accepted financial standards. It might not even be illegal. But you know that this is wrong. It is to, of detriment to, to, to society. So you, you will not do it even if the law of the land still hasn't caught up with some of that unethical conduct. Because they say the law is always catching up with what you know, financial experts and accountants manage to do. So this is why, this is the kind of knowledge that you require. The sixth key that we wanted to mention is a, is a basic principle, which is that you should never act without knowledge. You should never act without knowledge. They say Imam Bukhari has a chapter in the book of knowledge of his Sahih, of his great collection of rigorously authentic hadiths of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And that chapter is called Babul Ilmi Qabla Al Amal. The chapter on knowledge before action. Because when should you it says common sense, but as Oscar Wilde said, common sense is very uncommon. When should you learn about something? You should learn about something before you do it. Right? One of the great scholars of the 20th century, Sheikh Abdul Fatah Abu Ghudda, said it's like diving. A lot of people, what they do is they get on the diving board, they jump up and down, and when they're airborne, they say, Sheikh, is this okay? What do I do? So what can you tell them? You, you tell them, make sure you don't land on your belly, because right? it hurts. Right? Or make sure you land in the water and not, you know, on the edge of the pool, because... You know, you might be gone then. Right? That's all you can say. Other people are already on the diving board and they're jumping up and down. They haven't dived yet, so you can just tell them a few little things, right? But they're already doing it. One gains knowledge before one acts. But in terms of actions, right? You all, this is an important principle that you should never enter into something without knowing the limits of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala regarding that, that. How can I be in a state that is pleasing to Allah, that's in a, in a state of submitting to Allah in this matter? And if you don't know, then pause before you act. Right? Don't say, oh, it should be fine. Like, you know, can I make a few extra claims in my, ta in my taxes, even though I'm not, comp I'm not completely eligible, which means I'm not eligible. Right? I say, it should be fine. And once you've submitted the taxes, you go ask the Shaykh that, uh, Shaykh Idris, um, you know, in my tax returns, I fudged a few details, means I cheated. Right? Now, once you've submitted the taxes, what can anyone really tell you, right? So, yeah, go to jail, by, you know, and it becomes awkward. And even though the, the right course of conduct, if you do a wrong, you must redress that in the right ways. So, so this is an important principle, because if you act without knowledge, it's invariable that you'll fall into sin. Right? Imam Jalal al-Din al-Suyuti said, Man radiya an ya'mala bil jahl, faqad radiya an ya'asi Allah. Whoever is content to act without knowledge is content to disobey Allah. Right? Many people feel that you know, we as Muslims are exempt from traffic laws. Right? And no one ever told them that. They've never studied that in any madrasa or school that, you know, that, you know, that, Muslims should do the right thing except when it comes to traffic laws and parking laws, right? And use, using cell phones while driving, right? 
And this is wrong. I mean, it is very clear in Islamic law that you're, you're, you're duty bound to obey the law. Right? And if you don't, right, there's moral implications to that. Right? Now, there's some nuance to that because some laws would be wrong to disobey, but you won't, you're not necessarily sinful. Right? If you live in a historic area and they insist that you paint your house yellow inside and you decide to go with you know what is called Pakistani cream color it, it's wrong but it's not necessarily sinful but there's other things and that's a general case we're going you know, we're not we're going against the law breaking the law is sinful right you cannot go against traffic laws right? you cannot go against other limits such as not using the, your cell phone while driving. Say, oh, it's just my wife. So is, is there a wife except exemption from mobile usage laws while, while driving? No, no, there isn't. Right? So never act without knowledge. Because even on innocent things, you say, what's the big deal? I'm just answering my wife's you know, uh, phone call. Right? And they say, you know, fear of wife is fear of life. Yeah, displease your wife, you'll find much strife. Right? And, you know, and so on. I have a long poem about that, um, which, I, which started occurring to me when I came home once very late. So, so this is an important principle, right? Anything you enter into, don't rush into it. First, find out what's the right way of going about it for two reasons. One, that you be within the limits of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And number two, that you can do that thing in the best of ways that you can do that thing in the best of ways. And what's the best of ways? لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنًا لِمَنْ كَانَ يَرْجُوا اللَّهُ وَالْيَوْمَ الْآخِرِ Verily you have in the Messenger of Allah the most beautiful of examples for whoever seeks Allah and the last day. Now, the verse does not condition what the Messenger وسلم, will be the most beautiful of examples for. Right? You have the most beautiful of examples in the Messenger of Allah even in things that he did not do such as driving a car, right? Because if someone were serious, they would, try, they would try to seek the pleasure of Allah and seek to make their conduct correspond to the conduct and way of the Prophet ﷺ in everything, even in the things he did not do. Now, if the Prophet ﷺ were to drive a car, how would he drive a car? Anyone? How would he drive a car? Sorry? Yeah, he, he'd make dua, he'd make supplication. What else? How would the driving itself be? How would you describe that driving? Right? Showing respect to other drivers. Showing respect to other drivers. Why? Because you'd care about their good too. Right? What else? Yeah, not getting upset. Right? Staying calm. Yeah, deferring to others, letting someone needs to, you know, take, you know, cut across to take the exit, you know, he'd let them, right? And if you think about it, you can't imagine anything but the most beautiful driving, right? Why? Because his driving would be to seek the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. His driving would be a manifestation of excellence, beauty, and virtue. I haven't seen too many drivers who drive like that, right? Certainly in our community, we seem to be driving challenged, right? Why? Are we somehow exempt? No, right? we're not. But it's because we act without knowledge. We don't consider carefully how the, you know, that prophetic model of excellence is calling us to be in whatever we do. But that requires seeking knowledge. And that knowledge is not just through study. Right? Knowledge is both through study and through reflection. Because it doesn't require much to think about how the Prophet ﷺ would drive. Okay? How would he walk down the street? And we know specifics, but then you, you reflect. And you say, subhanAllah, I, I'm, I'm far, far from that standard of excellence when it comes to my walking down the street. You know? How should we be at the masjid? Sometimes you feel like it's a, you know, it's a graveyard. Everyone's like, Right? 
The Prophet ﷺ was always full of concern, yet he was always smiling. ﷺ. The seventh important principle, and this is more specifically legal, is that in anything that you do, uphold taqwa, uphold piety. Now, what is taqwa? The fuqaha, you know, the scholars of Islamic law are brutally practical, right? They say taqwa is very simple. Taqwa is that you avoid the haram. That's it. Very simple. Taqwa is that you avoid the haram. But there's more to taqwa than that. A taqwa is to shield yourself from that which would earn you the displeasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? The basic level of taqwa is to shield yourself from the impermissible, from that which is haram. But shielding yourself from the impermissible has two aspects. The first is that you do not do anything that is impermissible. And that seems kind of obvious. Right? But the other aspect of avoiding the haram is that you shield yourself from anything that could lead to the haram. Right? Particularly that which is likely to lead to the haram. So I have a friend of mine who, after hearing this, said, you know what, I've realized that it is haram for me to go to Dairy Queen. Do you guys have Dairy Queen here? Okay, Dairy Queen is an ice cream store, right? Kind of like Baskin Robbins kind of thing. You guys have Baskin Robbins here? You do? Okay, you do. Okay. Those who don't know about it should ask those who know. Okay. Um, I'm not um, encouraging anyone to eat, and if you fall sick as a result of it or gain too much weight, don't blame me. Right? In the U.S., they have amazing disclaimers for everything. Right? You, go to the, you, you go to the hotel, and it, you, see, you try to make some coffee. It says, caution, contents of, of pot may well be... You know, may well be hot. And you're like, gee, if the coffee isn't hot, there's problems. You, you're about to enter the washroom, it says, caution, f floor may be wet. Yes, I know, it's a washroom. I know what they're like. I've been going there since I was born, right? Everywhere there's warnings, right? And why? Because they want, there's a reason, because they want you to be careful, right? And because they're, they're afraid, that they want to be careful because they're afraid that you, you don't sue them. But in taqwa as well, there's, there's an underlying caution that you don't do anything that could lead you to harm. So my friend said, I think it's haram for me to go to Dairy Queen. I said, why? He said, well, because when I, I go there, I notice that there's a girl who works at the counter, and she's really pretty. So I always sit in a way that I'm, I look at her while she's working. Kind of sad, right? <laughs> so I guess that makes my going to Dairy Queen haram. I said, no, it makes your looking at her as you do while you go to Dairy Queen haram, right? But part of taqwa is protecting yourself from those actions. You know, there's nothing haram in going to Dairy Queen. But if something leads to the impermissible, it is to be avoided lest one fall into the impermissible. They say, means take the ruling of ends. Higher than, than this in terms of taqwa is that one guards oneself from doing dislike things, right? those things that are displeasing to Allah, and av avoids things that could lead one to things that are disliked. Right? So there's a sense of caution in one's religious practice. Similarly, the Prophet, so, and, uh, and also one, one, an important aspect of, of this higher level of taqwa is that one guards oneself not just from disobeying Allah, but also from wasting one's time, right? Because that is, that is not legally disliked, but it would lead you to miss out on much opportunity in life to do the good, right? Personally and socially. Right? So you missed out on the opportunity that this life is. And the highest of taqwa is that you guard yourself from anything that disadvantages you with Allah, that distracts you from Allah. Right? And that is, uh, those are higher levels of taqwa. The eighth principle that we wanted to mention is a principle of care and caution. The grandson of the Prophet ﷺ, Sayyidina Hassan ibn Ali, radiallahu ta'ala anhuma, he said that I memorized from the Messenger of Allah وسلم, leave that which would make you doubt for that which does not make you doubt. 
And it's significant that he said, I memorized this from the Messenger of Allah, because Sayyidina Al-Hasan, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, was very young when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam passed away. And many of the young companions of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they took most of their hadith from other more senior companions. So they narrate through more senior companions. And even some of those who became Muslim um, among the companions later, they transmit from the older companions some of their hadiths. Uh, but they're exceedingly careful. So they were so accurate in their, translation, in their transmission that you can't really easily tell whether they heard, normally, unless there's signs to the contrary, whether they heard this directly or through another companion. Because other companions who, narrated, who we know narrated directly, narrated exactly in the same way. They're exceedingly careful in their transmission. But this principle of caution, <coughs> that leave that which makes you doubt, is an important religious principle. Right? The, you know, what is caution? The Arabic term for it is wara, is to leave the doubtful, to avoid doubtful matters. But we need to understand what are doubtful matters. Because if you don't know the limits, everything is fuzzy. Right? And, you, and you can't then distinguish what is doubtful and what is actually impermissible or what is not doubtful. So there's two types of doubt in our deen. There's reasonable doubt and there's unreasonable doubt. And what is re recommended, what is praiseworthy to avoid is reasonable doubt. Something for which there is a reason to be doubtful. Right? As for avoiding things for which there's no doubt, Right? Out of caution, this is excessiveness. Right? And that is blameworthy because the Prophet ﷺ said, That those who go to excesses destroy themselves. So I had a friend of mine who stopped visiting his relatives. Why? He says, what if they serve me haram food? It might, my prayers won't get answered for 40 days. I told him, listen, if your uncles and aunts are upset with you, and your parents are mad at you, because you're not visiting any relatives, your prayers might, get, might not be accepted for your lifetime, right? And this is from caution, which is not based on knowledge. Do you know that your uncles serve the haram? No. And what do you do if they do, right? There's no, at least religious, command that says, thou shalt eat meat, right? There's no such command. Although in some of our cultures, it would appear to be the case, right? That not eating meat with every meal, right? Is somehow wrong, right? In some cultures, they even serve, have kebabs with the eggs for breakfast, right? And then they wonder why everyone has heart trouble, right? So reasonable doubt is doubt that is based on knowledge, where you know what the limits are, and this is something that is too close to the limits for your comfort, right? Or you're confused about it. Or there's difference of opinion about it that is strong. That's when you exercise caution. But the first step is to gain knowledge. Because without knowledge, you're confused anyways. And if you try to be cautious, you can go way beyond limits. Or you can say, no, everything's fine, and go to the opposite. If you want to be a person of, of caution in your deen, and that's highly praiseworthy, the first step is to acquire knowledge. Learn the limits first. And there's a practical aspect too, which is that if you strive to, to be of excellence in your religion, you want to be a, a person who's careful about the limits of Allah and the rights of others and so on, you have to bring in these levels of excellence in a gradual way because you can't do everything all at once. So that's why knowledge is so important. So you, the first thing you do is do what is obligatory for you, both with, with respect to the rights of Allah and with respect to the rights of other people, whether they be your parents, your spouse, your children, your neighbors, others, right? That's the first step. And then you try to, to uphold the standards of excellence. And in upholding the standards of excellence, you'll see that some things are doubtful. But that also requires knowledge as to how you deal with that doubt. I was in Amman when I was living there, and I invited some friends over. And we had a nice meal, and then we served them cake. It was a chocolate cake made at home. And one of my, I gave it to one of my friends, and he's looking at me, and he says, Is the cake halal? My nafs 
wanted to take the cake and, you know, and do the pie in the face thing. But the intellect prevailed. And I said, yes, it is. But then he challenged my restraint by saying, are you sure? More aggressive. Because I was kind of fed up of, the, you know, of an hour of annoying conversation right, where everything was being questioned, including why I, was, I had forks and spoons when the sunnah is to eat with your hands. And then, of course, he ended up eating with a fork himself, which is quite interesting. Right? So I said, yes, I'm sure. Right? But there's two. You, have, you need knowledge to know how to uphold caution. Right? Because you, knowledge will tell you that you have a duty to be respectful to other people. And you have a duty not to express baseless doubts about their actions. Right? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala warns that inna ba'da dhanni ithm that verily a lot of doubt or suspicion is sinful. Right? So that kind of question, when you have no reason to believe that I'd be serving you something that is haram, that question itself is sinful. Now, if you want to exercise caution, because you think I'm a, what we call in, Pakistan, in Urdu, harami, that I just do the haram, right? Don't eat it. Say I'm full, right? I, I, meaning I have no space for anything doubtful, right? Or say I've had enough, thank you very much, right? Or you could say, I'll take a slice home if you're friends, and you could go throw it in the bin if you want, or whatever. But you need, you need tact. Because one of the important things in upholding the law when it comes to relations with others is you have to have two qualities, which are consideration and tact. Right? And the word, I'm not going to, my, my friend Sheikh Yahya Rodas is convinced that, that the best translation for this important vir prophetic virtue of mudara is tact. I'm not that convinced. Right? He was very excited about this word mudara, tact. And perhaps it's tact, it could be also translated as consideration, which is that you uphold the truth, you uphold what is right, what is more proper, while considering people and circumstances, right? And this is one of the important reasons for learning, that you cannot be cautious unless you know how to be cautious, you can, and when to be cautious, and the priorities for being cautious. Some people are just, are, become excessively careful about a certain thing, they're very, very, very careful about ingredients in everything they eat, but then they go home and fight their parents about it, right? My, my younger sister, she, you know, when she started getting religious, and, um, or, too, or too religious uh, for a while, and sort of she calmed down, right? Um, she, I got a really nice ice cream for my mom, and she, and, you know, it wasn't even for her. You know, when you're a teenager, you know, it's not for you. I got it. She looked at the ingredients. I said, it's got liquor in it. I said, no, it's chocolate liquor. It's not, it's not, it's, got not, it's not alcohol. She says, yes, it is. So she turned on the hot water tap and put the ice cream underneath. <laughs> right? And she did it in a way, like, she must know how to play rugby or something. Because she, she squatted in a way that I had trouble going around her. Right? So this is, this is baseless doubt, right? And you have to know how to uphold it. And this is the ninth principle, which is avoid excessiveness. The Prophet ﷺ warned, right? That halakal right? That the, the, those who go to excesses destroy themselves. Excesses have a number of types. One excess is where you know what the limit is and you go well beyond it for no justifiable reason, just because you think that more is better, and no, more is not always better. Other, another case of excessiveness is when you don't know what the limit is, or you have a false perception of what the limit is, and as a result, you go overboard. And that is also harmful. Right? Or you try to be careful without knowing the principles of caution. Right? And that also is harmful. And, the, the danger with excessiveness is that it's not sustainable. They say, um, you know, the, the ulama say, ma kharaja an haddihi in qalaba ila diddihi. That whatever, whatever goes beyond its limits, 
in invariably turns into its opposite. So this is, this is baseless doubt, right? And you have to know how to uphold it. And this is the ninth principle, which is avoid excessiveness. The Prophet ﷺ warned, right? That halak al right? That the, the, those who go to excesses destroy themselves. Excesses have a number of types. One excess is where you know what the limit is and you go well beyond it for no justifiable reason just because you think that more is better and no, more is not always better. Another case of excessiveness is when you don't know what the limit is or you have a false perception of what the limit is and as a result you go overboard and that is also harmful. Right? Or you try to be careful without knowing the principles of caution, right? And that also is harmful. And the, the danger with excessiveness is that it's not sustainable. They say, um, you know, the, the ulama say, ma kharaja an haddihi in qalaba ila diddihi. That whatever, whatever goes beyond its limits in, invariably turns into its opposite, right? Because that excessiveness is unsustainable. The Prophet ﷺ said, Take from religious practice that which you can sustain. For by Allah, Allah does not tire until you do. That even the limits of excellence, you see people who've been practicing for years and they're doing loads of things. Don't try to do everything that they're doing. Right? The sunnah is to bring th this excellence into one's life in a gradual, sustainable manner. In a gradual, sustainable manner without taking on more at any point than you can manage, right? Without taking more at any point than you can manage, than you can sustain, lest you become overwhelmed. The Prophet ﷺ said, "Inna هَذَا الدِّينَ matin فَأَوْغِلُ فِيهِ بِرِفْق That verily this religion is deep. It's like a deep ocean. So enter into it gently. That just as you've been commanded to be gentle to others, be gentle to yourself. But if you bludgeon yourself, eventually yourself will say, okay, get out of the way. Because right? you're like a flock of sheep. You have some pious sheep and some wayward sheep. Right? And you have to get them all directed towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? If you give the wayward sheep a hard time, they'll take over. Because they're wayward to begin with. Now two keys to having clarity with respect to the halal and haram. The first is knowledge, right? Is knowledge. You need to learn and you need to learn from, from reliable sources, right? Sometimes not, you, it's not enough just to, to take things from books because some things are contextual. Even spiritual practices, people in different times and different circumstances have different degrees of, of spiritual readiness, right? So you read something that anyone who's serious about their religion should finish the Quran in a week. And you've not finished the Qur'an in, in your lifetime yet. That's probably not what you should be doing right now. Maybe in, a, in years down the road, you try to do it, you won't be able to sustain it. Or you'll feel overwhelmed about spiritual practice. The, the, other, the other key is good company. Keep the right company and you'll find that the right states and the right conduct will naturally become part of your life. But what is good company? Right? What is good company? They say good, and this is very important for us, particularly as Muslims um, in uh, countries with non-Muslim majorities. What is good company? The scholars say good company is of two types. The first type of good company is company that is inherent in its benefit. That just the act of keeping company with those people will be of benefit to you in, in your worldly life or in your religious life. That's one type of good company. But the other type of good company is company that is kept with a good intention in a good way. Even if those people are people who otherwise you may, be, you may not want to associate with, whether for worldly reasons, right? you don't like the guy, right? or for religious reasons. And this is very important. So let's say your next door neighbor, you know, you're someone who's very calm, you don't even listen to Islamic music. We just like calm and peace in your life. And your next door neighbor, you know, is still a remnant from decades past. He's into death metal. And his wife is too. Right? And their kids are too. It's incredible. 
It's a whole like death metal family. You call them the, the deaths, right? But they're your neighbors. So now, how can you have good company with them? Right? The neighbor has rights, but if you keep company with them in a good way, with a good intention, that's considered good company. Right? How do you keep good company with them in a good way? Invite them over to your house for food. Right? Go visit them, exchange gifts, all the little niceties that between neighbors you uphold, but in a good way. Then Mr. Dead tells you to, to come to a, a, a you know, concert with him, you excuse yourself. I reconnected with some of my friends from high school, and it turns out one of my closest friends is a, I, did, I didn't quite understand that, he's an environmentalist DJ. So he done, does dance parties to raise funds for environmentalist causes. So he found out like a year and a half ago that I was coming to London for a few programs. I said, Faraz, man, I have, this, <laughs> I have this dance party, I don't know, some famous club there. Why don't you come over? He's getting me some special tickets. And I said, well, you know, I have a lecture till quite late. And why don't we meet for coffee the next day? Right? Right? So it's company that's kept in a good way, right? with a good intention. And that's good company. Right? And that's important to understand in so many relationships. A, a lot of Muslims get very defensive. Oh, how can I become friends with a co-worker? Because like, how can I relate to them? Right? Yeah, don't do things that you would not do. Right? That, you, you, that you know that you should not do. But there's many things that are very wholesome that you can and should do together. Right? You have a shared interest in, in hiking. Go hiking. Go cycling. So many other things. Right? So these are two important aspects of being able to uphold the law with excellence. One is acquiring knowledge. The other is to be careful about the company that one keeps. And why does one do all this? As we mentioned at the beginning, and as Sheikh Idris clarified so beautifully in the opening, we do this seeking Allah and His Messenger, seeking closeness to Allah, seeking to bring the prophetic example into our lives. Um, in every aspect of our life, right? I asked one of the great shining lights of our time, Habib Ali al-Jifri, about how does one make one's work spiritual? And we'll close this session with this. He said that before you begin doing any work, whether it's worldly work or religious work, pause for a moment, right? And bring to mind the divine presence, that you, know, you are in the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then say, Bismillah. Yeah, Bismillah rahman rahim I begin in the name of Allah. But then before you begin, also bring to mind the prophetic example, right? Bring to mind the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, this radiant light of beauty and mercy, right? And he said, strive to, to you know, breathe in that, that beautiful example, that uswatun hasana, that most beautiful of examples, right? So that in whatever you do, you try to embody that prophetic virtue, that prophetic beauty, that prophetic excellence, right? And then begin, right? And then begin, says, and, and any action that you do will be completely different than just entering into it in a state of GSB. Do you guys, you know what GSB is? GSB is a general state of blah, right? Most of us just go through things as if somehow we're being tortured, right? Like, oh my God, I've got to get to work. Oh my goodness, I have, a, I have to have coffee with Abdurrahman. Oh my God, I have to do this. And it's like all this, you know, dragging ourselves. Whereas if you look at it, every moment is a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? So rejoice in it and make the most of it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Say in the bounty of Allah and in His mercy, in that let them rejoice, it is far greater than anything they amass. And everything you have and everything that you do and the limits themselves are all from the bounty and mercy of Allah. So rejoice in them, make the most of them and make them a means for closeness to Allah and His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam.